Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. My remarks are going to be based on the research project I've been leading over the last 15 months called Presence of Family Reintegrating Essential Care Partners in Ontario's Long-Term Care Homes. This is an implementation science team project, one of 14 that have been funded by Healthcare Excellence Canada and the Centre for Aging and Brain Health Innovation in Baycrest in Toronto. The project's been carried out by seven scientists from four institutions, as well as our research staff and graduate students who've been helping us. And we've also been supported by seven family members and long-term care residents who have played an active role in our research from beginning to end and in virtually all of the activities that we've carried out. And to thank them, uh, they received cash stipends from us. And we have also been working with three Ontario long-term care homes who partnered with us. And we were assisted by eight collaborating organizations who nominated representatives to our advisory board, including, for example, the Ontario Centers for Learning, Research and Innovation in Long-Term Care, the Ontario Caregivers Association, Family Councils Ontario, and the other organizations whose logos you see on this slide. The point I'm making here is simply that this was a real group effort. It was a work of science and also for many of us, a labor of love. I'm gonna give you a very brief summary of what the project involved and then share some findings with you. Basically, we supported three Ontario long-term care homes as they implemented their designated care partner programs during the pandemic. We also carried out a rapid scoping review, which was a quick look at the relevant scientific publications and policy publications that might be helpful in figuring out how family members could safely enter into long-term care homes during the pandemic. And one of our team members conducted an Ontario-wide survey of informal caregivers to find out how pervasive family care is in long-term care, what sort of care and how much care is provided, and to invite their general impressions on their long-term care home experience. We also evaluated the implementation of these designated care partner programs in our three partnering long-term care homes. And finally, we are now in the process of sharing our lessons learned. So what I wanna do then is share a few main points from our research, what we learned through our project. And first of all, we gathered data from family members throughout Ontario. And though we did hear some positive stories, for the most part, we heard about disappointment, suffering and pain. The pain was palpable in this data that we gathered. You see here uh, the, the kinds of terminology that people continue to use about how things were brutal in the long-term care homes, about ageism, mistrust, distrust. Long-term care home residents were compared to prisoners by some of our participants. One participant said that assisted suicide should be an option for people living with dementia in long-term care. We heard about insufficient staffing, lack of training, poorly paid PSWs, PSWs having to work in more than one home in order to make a living. We heard about broken processes, broken systems, and you see that final bullet point on this slide. We saw many quotations like this about being um, living through the darkest days of a person's life and doubting that they would ever fully recover. The fact is I could have filled a dozen slides with statements and quotes such as these, conditions were said to be terrible, distress was rampant, staffing shortages produced results described as horrible. The fact is it was very difficult to simply read through this data. Our data also shows a clear correlation between the well-being or lack thereof of long-term care residents and the presence or absence of family in long-term care homes. These two years that we have just lived through have been an astonishing natural laboratory. We've learned that family members provide essential care to residents. In March of 2020, when family were barred from entry, our participating long-term care homes report that responsive behaviors among residents living with dementia spiked upward. We also heard reports of the declining health and well being of residents. Then, later that year, when new visitation policies were created and families were allowed back into the homes, responsive behaviors spiked downward and staff reported noticing marked improvements 
in the overall well being of residents. Our data from throughout Ontario offers a view of the kind of care that family members provide. Our survey findings show that almost all family caregivers provide socio emotional support to residents, and a majority provide hands on care, such as assistance with eating, with getting dressed in the morning, and with bath bathing. Our quantitative and qualitative findings show that family caregivers monitor the care and well being of their residents and report changes to healthcare staff in the home. In other words, the act is a sort of early warning system for, uh, for, for their residents and uh, ensuring that changes are made when necessary. And I should say also that our qualitative findings show that many family caregivers feel that they play a vital advocacy role, mobilizing action when something is not right. And the implication here is that they believe that if they were not present, the action would likely not be taken. The clear message coming out of our data um, is that essential caregivers, family caregivers, are indeed essential. Essential is the right word to be using here. The health and well being of residents correlates with the presence of family. Our findings show that staff in long term care homes had a front row seat in this natural experiment that went on over the past couple of years. If you had asked them before the pandemic whether it was helpful to have family members present in long term care homes, certainly most of them would have said yes, because it made sense to them that that would be the case. But in the pandemic, they saw firsthand what happened when family members were barred from entry, and then what happened when family members were allowed back into the homes. This immediate experiential learning was visceral. For many, it seems to have provoked a sort of aha moment, even a shift in mindset about the importance of the contribution made by family members. Now, I do want to say that none of this suggests that long-term care staff do not also play an extremely important role. Clearly, that role is also essential. And what's more, much of our data strongly supports the contention that staffing shortages in long-term care are a serious problem. But what I'm emphasizing here today is our finding that the presence of family is vital, is essential for resident well-being. There's already a lot of talk going on right now about improving long-term care, and there's going to be a lot more talk about this in the coming months. And what I want to do in my final comment is to move beyond the specific findings from our research project and draw on my broader scientific field, the science of organizational and social change. And what I want to say is that improving long-term care is not a technical problem that requires a compliance regime focusing largely or exclusively on accountability. Think for a moment about the notion of expertise in relation to the problem of long-term care. There is no single disciplinary body of experts who we should turn this problem over to. The relevant expertise includes the expertise of the residents themselves. They are the experts in terms of their own preferences, goals, and health challenges, and their families are also experts in the preferences and life experiences of the residents. Improving long-term care is a relational problem, an adaptive challenge, or what some people call a wicked problem that requires accessing numerous perspectives, involving all of the key stakeholders and creating new patterns of thought, behavior, and structuring in long-term care environments that prioritize the fact that the long-term care home is indeed a home and that prioritizes the person of the resident who lives in that home. And Martine, I will, I will conclude my remarks with that. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Conklin, for sharing the um, very, very uh, important uh, findings from that, that research. I'm sure we're going to get questions later on. And I just want to remind participants today that they can already uh, enter their questions using the Q&A functions. We'll have about 20, 25 minutes at the end of the session today to take your questions. I'm now going to turn to Professor Ivy Bourgo, who will share her perspective on um, what has happened during the pandemic regarding the caregivers' roles and what is still happening today, and what could, can, can be changed as well. Professor Bourgo. Merci beaucoup, Martin, and thank you so much for including me in this really important conversation. 
uh, with James and Andre. So I want to take a slice of data from a project that was uh, undertaken before the pandemic, the SALTI project, Seniors Adding Life to Years, and we can thank Pat and Hugh Armstrong for coining that term. So really want to focus on the role of family and friends as caregiver partners and their contributions to quality of life, quality of care in long-term care. And this is also to acknowledge uh, other members of our team, Tamara Daly, Katie Albrecht, uh, Susan Bradley, as well as Pat and Hugh Armstrong. So just to give you a little bit of uh, perspective, uh, James outlined how uh, their project was organized. Um, our purpose in our project was to, to have a much broader expansive understanding of what is quality of care and what, what constitutes good quality for all of the different uh, people associated with long-term residential care. And then to identify enabling or promising practices um, at the point of care that could be shared um, with others. So we undertook very intensive field work in eight homes and in four provinces, two in each of Nova Scotia, Ontario, Alberta, and British Columbia. And as you can imagine, we could never undertake this type of research in the uh, pandemic period. It included a thousand plus hours of a direct work observation, uh, three to four days in each of the homes and full days. We wanted to make sure that we were there in the morning in the um, afternoon, in the evening for all of the different activities and making sure that we were also there over the weekend where there were you know, different staffing uh, requirements, different um, availability of, of supervisors. So many, many, many um, bits of field notes, some of which I will share uh, with you today in a couple of stories, uh, photos and um, 275 formal and informal interviews, which included uh, 33 family and friends, but we also observed many, many more um, instances of that. So just to kind of refresh everybody's memory, you know, in terms of the overview of long-term care services, you know, they're starting at the middle with um, help with activities of daily living. And this is typically the work that's done by personal support workers or healthcare aides. They're known by a variety of different terms across Canada you know, general um, activities that you need, bathing, dressing, and feeding. There's the meals and the dietetic staff, there's skilled nursing care, there's activities and leisure staff, rehabilitation services, pharmaceutical services, facility services, people to clean and maintain of the buildings, and then supervision. So we wanted to make sure that we captured all of these different roles in the work that we did. We wanted to, build a much more multi-dimensional concept of what is quality. And it really builds off, you know, some of the arguments that, that James has made that this is very much relational. So that there is quality of care, there's quality of life, and we have very particular measures for that. There's quality of work and quality relationships because it is very much relational care that's being done. And then we wanted to pull out some sentinel activities of daily living and daily working uh, for the residents of the notion of, and again, from a chronology of a day, getting up, transfers, toileting, bathing, grooming, the meals that you would undertake, activity, leisure, rest, and how you know, different responsive behaviors were, were dealt with. Now remember, so this is, these are people's homes, and so these are the things that you do during your day. And you would want to make sure that you have support and dignity in each of those tasks. And dignity requires some autonomy, some support, um, and also some choice. From uh, the care workers and the staff uh, perspective, some of the activities of daily working was appropriate communication and enabling that. Mentorship and training to respond to you know, new and emerging um, issues. Making sure that they had safety because we do have very high rates of violence. Uh, in long-term care facilities, and also safe staffing, safe staffing in terms of mix and as well as numbers. So I just want to kind of build on that staffing issue. So staffing in long-term care is notoriously challenging, and this predates the pandemic. It goes back decades. Minimum staffing levels and mix, so it's not just levels, but what is the appropriate mix, uh, is needed to enable residents to live safely and with dignity. And we really wanna highlight quality requires safety and dignity. 
uh, there exists probably in the range of two plus hours of personal care per resident per day. And there is a target of achieving a staffing level of four hours of care per day. How that particular target is uh, achieved um, requires a lot of staff. And as we know, there are challenges writ large across the health workforce in terms of, uh, in terms of staffing and shortages. In Ontario alone, this would require hiring 27,000 registered nurses, registered practical nurses, and personal support workers. How that's going to happen is very much a wicked problem, as James says. The lack of staff in long-term care has made and will continue to make family and friend care partners essential workers, as James outlined. It's important that they be included but at the same time that they should not be relied upon. They are not just another pair of hands, right? They are, they bring an important set of skills, but it's also important to recognize that not everybody in long-term care has a family or friend care partner. And so we need to, to recognize the inequity that there are. Uh, as James mentioned, care in long-term care is technical, but not only technical, it is also relational. Again, reminding this is a place where people live. This is not just a tertiary care center where the care is technical, it is relational. This is where people live and people work. And so we need to think of that whole umbrella in terms of quality of care. So I want to share with you uh, a story of Leonard, Leonard and this is pre-pandemic. Uh, Leonard, um, came to Canada with his wife uh, from the Netherlands. He recounted to me many, many really rich stories, which he said he had never really remembered and thought about for many times. And he said he was going to dream a lot after our conversation. It was very rich. He, um, so we're in, we're looking at these centers are in sort of small um, communities. They're not small, small, you know, villages, and, um, but they are not big cities. So he lives across town in the assisted living facility. He takes the bus every day to get to the long-term care center where his wife lives. His wife, who we will call Lenore, is wheelchair bound. She is deaf and she is blind. One would look at her and say, she has only an internal um, environment. His care work involves taking her out for walks to feel the fresh air on her face and skin because he recognizes that this is a sense that she has not lost. Otherwise, he sits with her in one of the smaller, quieter alcoves and there is his presence. There's probably his scent that calms her. And so that's really important um, you know, care work uh, that he does. He tells us of the story of their marriage and what he knows to be her likes and dislikes. This is knowledge that he has gained from years of experience living with her. He helps the PSWs feed her, respecting what he knows to be these likes and dislikes. He knows she does not like rice pudding. He will not even attempt to try to get any rice pudding into her. So he brings this experiential and relational knowledge that has been garnered over his lifetime to the care work that he provides. Another story that we have is of Liz in another um, city, another province. And Liz uh, came to visit her husband, her husband of over 40 years, uh, and he was in the local long-term care uh, center. She would come nearly every day for many years. This became part of her daily ritual. Um, it was the continuation of the care work that she provided to him at home. He uh, was suffering from dementia and uh, before the decision was made for him to move. And so she kind of felt lost at home, not doing that work. And so transferred that work um, into the long-term care um, facility. She would come early in the morning to attend um, uh, to some additional grooming, you know, there would be the minimum grooming, but, you know, there'd be other things that she would want to, to do for him. And that was sort of part of, you know, in, impressing upon her that he was there, you know, and grooming him in that regard. 
she would join him um, at breakfast. And although she didn't uh, participate in feeding, she would be there. And that would be part of their ritual was having breakfast together. She would often stay for quiet time after breakfast or um, accompany him to different activities that were arranged in the uh, recreational facilities, bingo being a favorite one of theirs, you know, using the dabbler. And in doing so, she got to know many of the residents uh, and staff and family members over time. When her husband passed, uh, she felt the loss of this new community. So she opted to continue to come to the center and uh, the managers of the center encouraged her to become uh, a volunteer on the board and the family council. And so that continued uh, her role. Um, so becoming sort of a, not just a family care partner, but a friend care partner. So family and friend care partners um, often become volunteers, whether um, they are there um, and their family member is still there or is not still there. And they have and bring incredible institutional knowledge, especially in care centers where there are a lot of staff that are coming from um, different you know, services or rotating. Um, and there's a lot of turnover uh, in some of these facilities. So they maintain or help to maintain that continuity of care. And they add what we call life to quality of life in long-term care. So some key take home messages from that work. And then I want to kind of um, pose what might've happened. And I think it builds a lot upon what James has already presented. The lack of recognition, formal recognition that we have of family and friend care partners is part of a broader disregard that we have in our uh, Western society of the experiential based knowledge that they have of family and friends in a society that focuses predominantly on credentials. And I recognize that I sit in a higher, uh, an institution of higher education and we promote that. But at the same time, we do have to recognize that there's knowledge garnered from experience. Not recognizing that is ageist because simply by being, we gain more knowledge. It is also sexist because much of this experiential care work, and I did purposefully try to choose examples of both a male caregiver and a female caregiver, but generally speaking, long-term care partners, care partners and residents are disproportionately women, as is the formal staff. It's also important to recognize that the role of family and friend care partners is not to negate the importance of getting to an appropriate staffing set of staffing models, staffing mix, and more appropriate hours of direct care for high quality long-term care. And I think that uh, echoes what James said originally. So this part would have to be conjecture on my part. We do not have um, specific data on that other than you know what we hear uh, and see in the media, how uh, the pandemic has treated care partners. I think public health protective measures have disregarded or ignored the essential role that family and friend care partners play. And it is, as James has mentioned, a natural experiment that we, we have seen that has made very clear the importance of their labor, which has often been invisible labor, and how it is very much value add. So their absence made that uh, their essential role very clear. Any long-term care standards around staffing models, mix, and uh, hours of direct care will need to reflect upon care partners explicitly as a potential asset, again, to include, but not necessarily rely on them. So I'll just close with a couple of other pieces that we've done. This was during the pandemic, reflecting on our findings, long-term care deserves our respect and it is essential, but essentially under-recognized. So both um, some articles in IRPP and a podcast. And um, also to thank uh, our different sponsors. This was a uh, work that was funded by CIHR with contributions from the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research, Research Nova Scotia, and for our particular um, group, the Alzheimer's Society. And these are ways that you can reach out to us. But I will pause there and uh, thank you for including uh, our team on this conversation. I look forward to the comments and questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bongo. And thank you once again for sharing uh, 
the findings of your research. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. These the stories, the personal stories here were, were, were fascinating. Et on va revenir à la fin. There are some words that have been used. I, I have many questions, but I will leave them to participants first. I just want to remind them that they can now enter their questions using the Q&A functions en français ou en anglais. Donc, c'est votre choix. Nous serons en mesure de les traduire. I'm going to turn to our third panelist, André Picard. The floor is yours. Uh, merci, Dr. Lagasté. C'est un plaisir d'être avec vous uh, ici aujourd'hui. Uh, unlike the other two speakers, I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm going to speak to you today as a journalist, as an author, and as a former family caregiver to two parents and two in-laws, one of whom died during the COVID pandemic, uh, living in an institution. Uh, because I'm not an academic, I don't have a PowerPoint, so I'm just going to talk for a few minutes. So, not, so as to not be too repetitive too, I, I want to focus on the structural and political underpinnings of long-term care, uh, but a little background and context to, to begin with. Uh, there have been about 35,000 COVID-19 deaths in Canada, and more than 20,000 of those has, have occurred in institutions like long-term care homes and, to a lesser extent, uh, retirement homes. This is and it remains a massacre of neglect. Uh, we can't use strong enough words to describe uh, the horrors of what happened in these institutions. Uh, COVID-19 didn't break long-term care. As you heard from the previous speakers, it was already broken in many ways. What the pandemic did was shine a spotlight, quite a harsh spotlight, on long-standing problems, on systemic neglect. Uh, as Dr. Borgo said very eloquently, ageism is really baked into our public policies and, to a lesser degree, our way of thinking as individuals. Uh, if it wasn't there, there was no way uh, that we would have tolerated tens of thousands of COVID deaths of our elders, and worse yet, dismissed them with these casually cruel comments like, well, they were going to die anyhow. Uh, I heard that many, many times, and it's not true. Let's not forget there are many countries that had a negligible number of COVID deaths in long-term care. Uh, these deaths that we saw in Canada were largely uh, preventable. They were not inevitable in any way. Many of the problems in Canadian healthcare can be explained by our history. I'm kind of obsessed with the history of healthcare because it explains so much of what's going wrong today. And long-term care is no exception. Uh, long-term care facilities, a lot of people don't know this, but they have their roots in the penal system, not in the health system. And they're still very much an aside. They're not uh, integrated into Medicare or into the larger system. Uh, they were designed to house indigent elders with no family. Uh, they were essentially, for centuries, they were workhouses. And the prisoners, uh, sorry, residents, uh, these people were expected to work for their room and board. And this system actually existed in Canada until the early 1960s. This still existed in my lifetime. And to this day, uh, many of our long-term care homes still look and feel like prisons. I've visited many, many care homes, and you get that feel. Uh, you know, there are wardrooms, regimented meal times, and of course, that smell. Everybody knows that smell of a long-term care home, uh, one that shouldn't exist. Now, religious institutions, to be fair, also played a major role in the provision of care, and they do to this day. But again, the philosophy was to provide only the bare minimum, and work was expected in return, whether it was working in the garden, uh, in the church, whatever. So let me turn specifically now to the, the topic at hand, caregivers. Uh, one cannot reasonably live in a long-term care facility, or in the community for that matter, with current levels of support. One cannot reasonably do that anymore without a lot of help of family caregivers. Uh, people who don't have family who are institutionalized are at a grave disadvantage. We have to admit that openly. It's unfair, it's inequitable, and as Dr. Borgo said again, it was, it's very sexist and often racist, these policies that we have. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to care for your loved ones, as many of us have done, but we are, for the most part, in privileged positions, able to do that. Now, given staffing levels and the assembly line nature of service provision, uh, I think no family support is not a reasonable option anymore if you want basic care. Uh, and now I don't want you to interpret my comments as blaming workers, because that's not what I'm doing. Uh, the conditions of work are the conditions of care. Uh, that's something that Pat Armstrong famously said, and we can never forget that. Uh, the workers we have today are, are overburdened. They're in an environment that, for the most part, is terrible. Uh, they're underpaid, overworked, 
neglected, taken for granted, it, you can, the list goes on and on. And again, Dr. Borgo has much expertise in this area. Now, as a result of this poor work environment, essential caregivers are, as you heard earlier, they are indeed essential. Uh, at least if you want to eat, if you want to have human contact, if you want to see sunshine occasionally, this is all done by families. It's not done by anyone else. And it's because workers don't have the time to do it. They're not rewarded for this. They're rewarded to do tasks. And that whole human connection that's so essential to good care is too often lost. And I have to say, I, I spent much as uh, many months during the pandemic writing a book about elder care. And I have to say, nobody hates this more than the workers themselves. Uh, the main complaint uh, when I talk to personal support workers, nurses, etc., it's not about being underpaid. It's not about their hours. It's about, I don't get to talk to people anymore. I don't get to interact. I don't get to know their names. I just have to do my stuff. Now, that's not a good work environment. Now, according to Statistics Canada, there's about 7.8 million Canadians who provide care to a loved one in any given year. And for the most part, these are uh, elders, uh, elderly parents or spouses. Uh, about one in 10 of those caregivers, 780,000, provide more than 50 hours of care weekly. In other words, they have full-time unpaid jobs of caregiving. Again, we neglect this, the, the force of this and the size of this workforce. Now, most people, uh, as they did in my family, uh, they provide this care willingly and they do it lovingly if they have the means to do it. And this is admirable. But the reality is we exploit them. We come to expect it. And that's wrong. Uh, during number, during COVID-19, uh, we saw this come to a head when uh, uh, family caregivers were removed from facil facilities, we began to really appreciate their worth, as we heard doc Dr. Conklin say, and it shouldn't have taken that. Now, during the pandemic, a number of restrictions were placed on the public to limit the spread of the pandemic virus. Uh, you all know about these measures, and most of them were justified. But I think one of the most egregious policies we saw during the past two years was this cruel combination of uh, locking residents of long-term care homes uh, and retirement homes into their, their facilities, into their homes, and locking out their essential caregivers. It really did feel like prison, uh, and prison without visits. To make matters worse, uh, paid care providers were not only allowed to come and go, they often worked in multiple facilities. Again, there were economic reasons for this, but it's the principal reason many homes were ravaged by COVID outbreaks, because the virus was brought in by workers, because no one else was going in or out. Now, the COVID deaths, there were many of them, and they were the easy ones to count. Uh, it's almost impossible to measure the impact of loneliness, and isolation, deconditioning, fear, all these emotions that residents uh, lived. Uh, my father-in-law died during uh, the pandemic, not of COVID. Uh, we say that he died of loneliness. He was an active 88-year-old, uh, played tennis three times a week, went to church every day, uh, played bridge uh, almost nightly, and suddenly he was locked into what was supposed to be his home. It became an institution. It became a prison. Uh, he became depressed. He lost his will to live, quite literally, and one day sat down after lunch, died of a heart attack. Now you can say he was going to have heart condition already, but he, he literally died of being abandoned and lonely. And his family was shut out during all this time. And that was the cruelest part of the equation. Now, the neglect was so profound uh, in this pandemic that in some institutions, residents actually died of starvation and dehydration. This occurred in Canada in 2020. This is unthinkable. It's unconscionable, but it occurred and we shouldn't forget it. Now, in our health system, there's a lot of flowery rhetoric about patient-centered and family-centered care, but I think our COVID-19 policies exposed much of that as a lie. Uh, you can't call family caregivers essential and then leave them powerless when it comes to policymaking. You can't leave them staring at windows at their loved ones and not being able to intervene. That's not family-centered in any way. Uh, it's not enough to have family councils. You have to give them decision-making power. It's not enough to have lovely uh, documents like a caregiver bill of rights, as many provinces have. Uh, and it's worthless if you don't abide by the spirit, never mind the letter of the document. And we don't do so. Uh, 
Another major problem in my view is our failure to provide family caregivers with training and support. Many life-changing decisions, anybody who's been there knows this, any of these decisions come at a time of great crisis, uh, health crisis. Families need help navigating the system, which is unbearably obtuse and complex and unfriendly. And we don't give them that navigation help, we should. Caring for a frail elder upends your life in many, many ways, economically uh, and emotionally and mentally, physically. Uh, anyone who's ever bathed someone with dementia knows that this is really skilled work. You need to learn techniques to keep your loved ones safe. Uh, the same is true of feeding and toileting, especially if you have a choking hazard with a, a loved one. Uh, prenatal and parenting classes are the norm in our society now. I, I think elder class, elder care classes should also be the norm. We all need them. We're all going there. We can't fool ourselves. We're all going to be a caregiver or a care receiver at some point. Uh, if we're going to expect a lot of family caregivers, and I think we should without exploiting them, we also need to change our workplace policies. It's no secret that the vast majority of care, uh, especially the most intimate and challenging aspects of care are provided by women. Uh, mostly spouses and daughters, and increasingly by granddaughters. Uh, to many of them, to, many of them have to make major financial sacrifices. They leave their jobs, they cut back their hours, they lose promotions, they see their wages and, and pensions take a hit. There's a real economic injustice there. Recently, the federal government announced a $30 billion child care plan, uh, which aims to provide affordable quality daycare for about $10 a day. Now, every province and territory has signed on to this initiative, with one exception, and that's Ontario. Uh, while I applaud this initiative, I think it's great, I have to wonder why we're not making a similar commitment and investment in elder care. After all, as many women care for elderly parents as care for young children in this country. That's the demographic reality. And if child care, which can cost about $1,200 in some parts of the country, uh, $1,200 a month is considered unaffordable and politically unpalatable, I'm not sure how we should describe long-term care, which ranges anywhere from $2,000 to $15,000 monthly. Now, I'm not suggesting long-term care should be free, in quotes, because there's a housing element to it, but the care element should be standardized. Uh, it should be of higher quality, and it should be affordable, just like childcare. And there should also be choice. That's part of dignity, as Dr. Borgo said. The vast majority of people as they age want to remain in the community, but the default setting in our system is to send them to institutional care. Uh, this results in lesser quality of life for many, and it's economically inefficient. You know, I think after years of neglect, we need to invest more in the sector, but not that much more. We shouldn't forget we already spend a lot of money on elder care, about $37, $37 billion a year but we don't spend it wisely or smartly. Now, when we discuss elder care, long-term care in particular, there's a lot of nihilism. There's no question there's a lot to fix. It can feel like an impossible task, but I don't feel hopeless about this at all. Uh, and there's a simple reason why. I, I think we know all the problems and we know all the solutions. Uh, since the advent of Medicare, there've been about 150 high level reports published about how to reform the healthcare system. Every one of them have tackled elder care to some degree, to some depth. Now, the other speakers have told us quite eloquently that improving long-term care is both a technical and relational challenge. Uh, I've talked a bit about the political and structural challenges, but I think there's one more thing that's essential, and I want to end with that. Uh, fixing long-term care and elder care more broadly requires, first and foremost, a philosophical shift for all of us. Uh, we have to stop catastrophizing aging. The fact that the fastest growing demographic in our society is centenarians is actually a good thing. It's a miracle of modern medicine and social policy. We should be celebrating the fact that we all live longer and healthier lives. Only a tiny proportion of people end up in care. Still too large a proportion, but let's not forget the 93% of people who are aging quite well and quite healthily. Uh, we have to stop viewing elders as disposable. Uh, if we adopt a philosophy that says we value our elders and we want them to be an integral part of our communities, I think the fixes are actually pretty easy. As critical as I am about the state of long-term care in this country, 
I also like to stress that we have some excellent facilities. And there's one common trait that all of the best facilities share. It's that residents and their families have a voice. They're empowered. Uh, they have dignified care. We should be scaling up our successes instead of repeating our failures. You know, I think Canadians have good values. I think all of us love our mothers and our grandmothers, even our mother-in-laws. We have to, we want the best for them. We want their care to be dignified above all. Collectively, I think we should expect everyone to get the same care that we want for ourselves and our loved ones. And this is doable. All we have to do is give life to our values. So again, thank you for the invitation. I look forward to participating in the question period. Thank you very, very much, uh, Picard. A fascinating uh, presentation. So there's lots of questions in the Q&A. As I mentioned before, I also have lots of questions. Some words that you know really spoke to me, relational problem, communication, dignity, ageism, philosophical shift, which is probably the biggest challenge, how we see aging, how we perceive older adults, how we perceive vulnerability as well. Uh, but I just want to go through the list because there's a lot of questions. I'm going to start with uh, James. There's a question for James uh, Conklin. So if family and friends, and friends caregivers are essential, why are we labeling them as informal and what can we do to improve their recognition? That's a question. Well, it's a question for James, but Ivy and Andre, feel free to jump in the discussion. Well, if, if the word informal carries some sort of implication that, uh, that caregivers, uh, family caregivers are not important, then certainly it is a term that we should not be using. Um, as far as the, the 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 terminology to use right now, we're we're jumping around between essential caregivers and essential care partners and and so on. But for me, the 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 thing that stands out for me, I guess, is um, you were, you were mentioning a moment ago this idea of a philosophical mm -hmm. shift. And for me, what what I think we're seeing right now over the past year and a half or so is a kind of uh, a change in mindset, a kind of new realization among some people at any rate about the significance of family in long-term care and uh, the importance of making sure that you might say the configuration of relationships within long-term care is, is tuned, is changed somewhat in order to um, enhance the well-being of of the residents. So, you know, one of the things that we need to consider, there's a lot of talk going on right now, work going on right now, in fact, about, about creating standards, for new national standards for long-term care and consideration about how those standards could include family members. And it does seem to me that it would be a very good idea if um, the role of family members, the role of, uh, of care partners, other than members of the uh, the long-term care staff could be ensconced in the standards in some way. But then again, I must say that, um, you know, when we talk about, when we talk about changing and improving long-term care, I noticed that one of the things that, that Andre talked about was, was that we know the solutions, plural, the solutions. And it does seem to me, we do need to recognize we have many health systems in Canada, not just one, and that each long-term care home is its own unique social environment, social context. There's not going to be, as some people say, a silver bullet that can be applied to every long-term care home. I think that that's maybe been part of the problem up to this point. We need to realize that, that the process for bringing about improvement, I think anyhow, is a process that needs to provide guidance and resources for long-term care homes, but then also empower the homes to make use of their unique circumstances in order to bring about improvement for, um, for the residents. Emp empower, I would add also, James, empower the older adults themselves as well. I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of the philosophical shift. I think this is, for me, the umbrella. Uh, lots of things are going on right now, but um, you know, we can question, is it gonna change our culture around how we see aging and how we see older adults and so on? Um, another question, question for Professor Bulgo. Given the staffing issues you're raising, any suggestions on ways to ease the workloads on the staff while ensuring that residents get the care they deserve? 
Yeah, so that's, it's a very important question. Uh, it sounds like a simple question, uh, which could have a simple response, such as increasing the number of staff and the staff contact hours, absolutely. Um, that's going to be, you know, more difficult to, to implement, absolutely. So we want to make sure that we look at staffing and the work that is done in uh, long-term care in a broader perspective. You know, just even building off of the earlier question about informal, there's this connotation that it's, you know, not as recognized um, knowledge. So I think part of that philosophical shift is making sure that the experiential knowledge that as essential caregiver care partners um, bring is, is recognized. Um, but absolutely, there is a staffing crisis. It is felt most acutely uh, in long-term care, but it's across the healthcare system broadly. I think that we need to study how to uh, how to implement a variety of different solutions. Right, this is a complex problem that is going to require uh, a multitude um, of solutions, but they need to be evidence informed, and it needs to bring in a variety of different types of evidence. My worry with long-term care standards is what will become a standard is something that can be quantified and it becomes a checkbox. And mm -hmm. what our project was really, really most importantly trying to say is that we need to think differently in a much more qualitative way to look at all of the different dimensions of uh, care in long-term care. Thank you very much, uh, Ivy. Here's another question, and the three of you can address this question. Caregivers are not only essential to the resident they visit, when allowed to interact with other residents, many who do uh, do not get regular visitors, it brings joy to them. And that was, I think it was very well reflected in your presentation, Ivy. Uh, we need to allow caregivers to join in activities and interact with other residents. We need to stop being too restrictive out of an abundance of caution so we can balance risk with quality of life. How do we move towards this? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, I think that any type, any we need to have a huge reflection on how public protective measures, public health protective measures were implemented. And Andre pointed out the inconsistencies with this. So I think that we first of all need to, to recognize that. Um, it could involve training. Um, absolutely. And recognizing that, you know, what is it that you might bring in, you know, to a long-term care facility? Um, in addition to your expertise, you might be bringing other um, things, you know, from a, a public health safety perspective. So I think having um, some training, I think uh, recognizing what it is that we're trying to achieve. And if your measure is only whether or not you live or die, that's an important measure, of course, but it is not the only measure. And Andre's comments have, have alluded to other uh, measures. And it's one of the things that we tried to do with looking at quality of life much more broadly and dignity through the variety of different activities that are undertaken in long-term care. I can't help jumping in and ask a question to the three of you because the three of you have mentioned the issue of ageism, which is again, it's kind of an umbrella. It's the it's the backdrop of the discussion today. Well, part of it actually. So how do we address ageism in the context of recognizing informal caregivers instrument, very, very central role, as well as the voice of older adults? How do we how do we fight ageism? How do we change things around aging? I know this is a very, very broad question, but it's so important when we talk about improving care for older adults and, and residents in long-term care. André Picard? I think it's like any other social change issue. You have to make people more visible. Uh, we literally take older people now and we shunt them off into institutions, mm -hmm. which are often out by the highway. Uh, we have to integrate people in society. I think that's uh, visibility is the number one way to change things. Uh, I point to, you know, there are countries who do this much better. I, Denmark, I think, is uh, almost everybody agrees is the gold standard. What do they do well? Well, they build, uh, when they have long-term care homes, which are a last resort, for, first of all, they invest heavily in community care. The whole system is designed to keep people living in their community as long as possible. So that's important. So you see 95-year-olds on their bikes 
uh, in when you go to Copenhagen, it's normal to see old people. Uh, when they build uh, long-term care institutions, they're small, they're home-like. They build them beside schools because they believe older people should interact with young people. One of the worst things in our society and our system is this assumption that old people only want to live and talk to old people. And it's not true. Uh, I think that uh, elder care homes should always be beside daycares or schools and there should be interaction. There's nothing nicer than seeing a group of uh, uh, preschoolers go into a, an, an, an old age home. This would happen when my kids were in daycare, they were beside uh, what we call a CLSC in Quebec mm -hmm. and the kids would go visit and the elders loved it. It brought joy to them. And the kids, kids are not judgmental. They thought it was fun too. So just these little things matter so, so much to, to addressing issues like ageism. The final one I'll mention is we have to change our own attitudes about ourselves. Everybody says, oh, I'm getting old, I'm getting rickety. You know, I have a, a, an uncle who's 91, who's in a, a Dixieland jazz band uh, tours, and he complains that, you know, my, my band takes too much time, I don't have time for sailing. That's, that's the reality of many older people now. They have very active, rich lives, and we should emphasize that, not just the, the small minority who, of course, need care, but that's not, that's not the reality of most people. Ivy, James, anything to add on that? I would like to add something, yeah. uh, Martine, and I agree with what uh, Andrea is saying, uh, making people more visible and working on that, that change of attitude, I think is very, very important. A third thing that I would add to that is that we need to talk about it. Uh, we can't just sweep it under the rug. We need to talk about it. We need to have the conversation such as we are having here today. And so, um, you know, um, I think that Andre has done a wonderful job in his book on the subject, talking about how the origins of our system and the origins of our system in part coming out of, out of prisons, out of incarceration, and how curious it is that in my data, more than once, there's more than one data point of uh, in the qualitative data of people speaking about the experience of their family member in long-term care homes right now in Ontario today as being similar to that of a prisoner. And so isn't that interesting that that legacy continues? We need to talk about this. Uh, Ivy talked about the importance of reflecting on what happened in the early months of the, um, of the pandemic. And uh, Andre alluded to the many studies that have been done of the healthcare system. And I would say also studies specifically done on long-term care. And so in a way, this is a kind of classic Canadian thing. We have diagnosed the problem and there's this reputation that we have in Canada of being this country of pilot projects, where we do a project to bring about improvement. We discover that, yes, it's possible to improve. And then we put it in the binder and put it up on the shelf and we don't follow through. We need to follow through now. And one of the things that is going to allow that to happen is if we have conversations like this and continue to have conversations like this, uh, where we start moving from talk into action. Yeah, and that's what we were hoping to do with our studies, really talk about how do we take these promising practices and scale them, right? And um, I also just want to reflect on a comment that Andre made, and I think the more that we can make connections between elder care and child care, and it's care, right? We all need care. And um, I reflect on, you know, when, when babies come, you know, to visit or children come to visit in long-term care, I know my mom's eyes just completely light up. And uh, she also has this thing about that what she tries to do to all of the residents in her long-term care facilities is imagine what they would look like as babies. And she said, I think if we all imagined everybody as a baby, maybe we would value everybody a little bit more, right? Because we see them as incredibly cute and that sort of thing. And so I think there's, you know, that's just another example. There's incredible wisdom that comes out of, you know, just these small comments from, from folks in, in long-term care. Uh, a question for you, Mr. Picard. Um, is Mr. Picard studying the current direction of the Ontario government in awarding new LTC beds to for-profit homes? Any thoughts you may share on this as for-profit homes have to balance making profit for shareholders and operating on limited funds to provide care to residents? So this is a very contentious, uh, much discussed issue of privatization. Yeah. So I'll answer it in yeah. two stages. One, I'll say off the bat, do we need for-profit homes in theory? No, we don't need them. But 
we, why, we, we should be asking the question, why do we have them? So why do we have them is because governments refuse to invest in infrastructure. They don't want debt. So we fob this off on the private sector. So I don't think we can blame entirely the private sector for this uh, because we've, we've created this problem ourselves. Uh, second, I don't think it's a panacea. A lot of people say, oh, let's get rid of for-profit homes. Everything will be magically better. The worst outcomes during COVID were in Quebec, which has the fewest for-profit homes. It's not a magic solution. Uh, I think the solution to this was put forward in actually a very good report that came out of Ontario uh, during COVID, where they recommended that we separate the real estate aspect and the care aspect of, of long-term care. And that's the problem. These are, I call them slum landlords running a lot of these homes. All they care about is the rent. They don't want to provide the care. They don't do it well. They would happily get out of the care business. So I believe that all care should be provided on a not-for-profit basis as with the rest of our system. And I don't care who owns the building, to be honest. Let's pay them rent or lease the buildings. That's what they want. I think that's a win-win. So I don't. I think this notion we hear this uh, rhetoric about let's get rid of for-profit care. It's not going to happen. You know, it's uh, half of homes in Ontario are for-profit. It's not going to happen overnight. But we have we can change the structure and solve the underlying problems. Uh, the final thing I'll say about Ontario, I think a much bigger problem in Ontario than uh, private homes is that their obsession with building bigger and bigger homes. I think we should be going the other way. We should have family-like facilities. We shouldn't have these BMOs with 300. There's plans to build one in the outskirts of Toronto, almost 600 beds. That, that's not where people want to live. That's awful. So let's, let's go the other way. So make it more look like a home, smaller, smaller places. Yeah. Absolutely. Places like uh, Denmark and Finland, uh, the countries that do good elder care, that's their approach. And which, make, it which, a, make it a last resort, not a, not a first reflex to institutionalize people. Which, which relates to the notion of relational. Vraiment la capacité d'établir des liens. Um, just coming back to something that was discussed, a question, an open question again to the three of you. How can we bring intergenerational partnerships into homes so that residents can benefit from interacting with more non-family members. Yeah, I think I think that there's a way that you could do that both structurally, you know, as Andre mentioned, um, let's think about where we locate these facilities, the size of facilities, how we integrate them with other um, civic activities, um, civic services. So there are structural um, dimensions to that. There is a change in our, and that may, that visibility may enable us to change our mindset um, around these issues as well. And, um, but we will have to, we will have to change minds, you know, of, of, of folks. And maybe um, the promising practices that we would want to encourage is where those intergenerational um, linkages and relations uh, already exist, um, you know, with indigenous communities, with certain um, immigrant um, communities. I think it would be really helpful uh, to have those types of um, those types of connections. Those would be a few that I would say. Um, I, might, if, I might add, if you don't yes, mind. Yes, Jim, um, go ahead that uh, just sort of putting my organizational change hat on for a second. And well, one of the things that successful organizational change often shows is that a, a, an effective starting point is to notice what you already have, and then to think about how we could move towards something more positive based on some things that we already have. Here in Ontario, we have these family councils in the long-term care homes. And I must say that in our, in our research, we found uh, a number of times we encountered participants who would talk about the important contribution that the family councils could make to bringing about improvements in the homes, but we also encountered ignorance of the very existence of the family councils. And so to me, I, I just have the sense that this might be a mandated structure that we have in place, but that we haven't, we haven't grown, we haven't supported quite enough yet. And, and so when you talk about forming relationships with uh, across the generations, you know, one of the things that occurred to me is, well, we need to get people together in the long-term care home and other community leaders and talk about that. So how do we do that? And in, in our work, we found some talk now and then about forming partnerships between specific long-term care homes and schools. 
for example. And then, and then thinking about, well, what could we do with this partnership that would be useful and sustaining for both the residents of the long-term care home and the children in the schools? There's all sorts of ideas that could be explored. The, what I worry about is that, that institutional leaders will think it's up to them to make those decisions and then impose them on the homes. I think it's rather the case that institutional leaders should be facilitating these conversations, bringing people together to make their own decisions, their own recommendations based on what's available in those communities. Um, in the short term, if we think short term, what, what would you recommend to a provincial government and federal government? Uh, what should be done in the next two years to turn things around for those who live in long-term care facilities? And I know this is a difficult question, and we have already mentioned some examples of things that could be done, but within the next two years, what would you recommend to the provincial and federal government to shift things around? Who'd like to jump in? André? Sure, also I'll start. I, I think you have to invest in families. I think we have to invest in that navigation, which is really difficult. We have to invest in training. Just give people tools to, to do what they're expected to do, I think is a really good starting point. And I think we have to start shifting. Actually, I think a lot of the solution to long-term care homes lies elsewhere. It's getting people uh, the choice to stay in the community, giving them uh, investing more in home care. So I think it's almost paradoxical. I think one of the ways to fix long-term care is to spend less there, to spend it elsewhere. Uh, we can benefit greatly from keeping, you know, we know it depends on the study anywhere from a quarter to half of people in the institutions don't need to be there. We can provide that care elsewhere. So I think that's the, the starting point is make them less the, the, uh, the default position. So just to build off of Andre's comments, I, I, I agree that I think that we need to have a broader systems lens on this. We need to think of older adult care as including long-term care, but also look at assistive living, look at home care, and to think of it as an entire system because in the staff who are working in long-term care also work in those other sectors, right? And what we saw during the pandemic is you know Peter robbing from Paul? You know home care uh, being robbed essentially from uh, from long term care because there were incentives in long term care and so people shifted around, right? I mean it's in part a finite resource that we have, um, you know personal support workers. So how do we keep more of them in the system? So um, our um, colleagues, you know, for example, in the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions, they say the first thing that we do about a shortage is you address retention. The retention in long-term care and in older adult care more broadly is horrible. How do we retain the workers? How do we bring back workers who are in the system? And just in some of the communities that we, that we visited and spoke to, not, not so much for this project, but for other projects, you know, people would talk about how the attrition through the personal support work training programs was about half. Why? You know, because they saw how hard the work was, how poor the wages were, the safety issues. And so there were other options, you know, for them to go to. So how do we address, you know, a whole set of pipeline issues to, to the staff and, 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 you know, in order to provide care, not just in long-term care, but assistive living and in home care. So if we took that systems view, I think that would be really important. It's a complex problem, wicked problem, as James mentioned. It is going to require a variety of different solutions all along the various pathways where these problems lie. But as Andre has mentioned, let us stop studying this. We have many things that we need to move to implementation and not implementation in, you know, a thousand flowers pilot studies, demonstration projects that have an intention to um, build to scale. And because there isn't a one size fits all problem, yes, we are talking today about patient and family partners. What do we do in those circumstances when people do not have patient and, and, and family or um, you know, family and friends who can be partners? We have to think about that, you know, that it is a, a one size fits all approach. James, I think you want to, yeah. 
Martin, uh, you asked about what, what we would say, what I would say to uh, a political leader such as the Premier of Ontario. And I will confess to you that in a moment of idealistic foolishness in mid-December, I wrote a letter to the Premier of Ontario answering that very question. Strangely, I've not heard back from him. <laughs> but I will tell you that among the things that I, that I said, I, I hope it was a friendly letter. It was meant as a friendly letter about something I care deeply about. And among the things I said to him was, uh, Premier, please do not rely entirely on beefing up your compliance regime. I do understand that there is a need for accountability and compliance, but through some of my research doing ethnographic work in long-term care homes, I have seen the unintended consequences produced by too much reliance on um, compliance regimes. And some of those unintended consequences are extremely negative. And so let's not put all of our eggs in that basket. Instead, let's think about how we can mobilize the energy, mobilize the intelligence and the desire to bring about positive change throughout the province. And it's, it's I have to say, from what we know about organized, the science of organizational change, it should not be an entirely top-down approach. Certainly senior people in the ministries and so on should be involved, but so should people at the grassroots level, and so should families, and so should the residents themselves be involved in the reform and improvement that we all hope is going to take place. Uh, Matsin, if, if I could yes, jump in ahead, here. Duncan. I yeah. saw there's a question, mm -hmm. the questions about this, I think it's really important how we really have this bureaucratic system. So I'll give you a, an example. I visited an Ontario long-term care home that showed me a 91 page list of things that they had to do, sort of a checklist. Does that result in good care? No, quite the opposite. It's just a, a, a burden. If I visit a home as I've done in uh, uh, Copenhagen, I ask them, well, where's your list of things you have to do? And they say, there's no list. We, our workers are empowered. They do what has to be done. The families have a say if they, you know, if uh, their loved ones are not cared for in a way they expect, they have a power to complain and to change things. They don't need a whole bunch of rules and check boxes. They say, what do people need? And they do it. Uh, that's a very different approach. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we're at a stage where we can do that in Canada, but I think we can get rid of a lot of our rules and replace them with uh, an approach. Uh, and once you have adequate staff, once you empower families, a lot of that stuff just falls by the wayside. It doesn't become necessary if you don't have a, uh, you know, we have this model that's like a, a factory uh, checking off each element rather than a, a system that says, go in and see what Mrs. Smith needs. If she needs to have tea, have tea with her. Uh, if she needs to be uh, to toileting help, do that. And just don't have all these, these rules and, and that are just burdensome and not helpful. Well, and much of the unintended consequence of those rules is to take care away, direct care away, because they have to spend time checking off those boxes and then collating the checking off of those boxes. <clears throat> those boxes are disproportionately quantitative. So as you know, Pat Armstrong famously says, what counts is what can be counted. And does that actually deliver quality care? The concept that they're talking about and in, in a different realm, but it's about regulation in general um, in the UK is that the terminology is right touch regulation. And it really is what is the regulatory regime that we need to have in order to get us the outcomes that we need to have. And we need to pay attention to intended and unintended consequences in that as well. Questions are coming in nonstop. So I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna pick one, uh, one of the last questions that I see. If we invest in home care and divest, divest from long-term care, how do we make sure that this does not doesn't go to people who are already able to provide for themselves, either through family or their own resources? Yeah, I would just say it's not an either or. And that's why I was arguing that we really need to look at this as a system. And we and it's very important for those who are making those governance and regulation and funding decisions that they look at this as a system because if you do something here there's going to be a pressure over here so we need to think about 
a variety of different tools that need to be exercised. So that, you know, that question speaks exactly to what I was trying to say with, with that response. I think that question is, it's an equity yeah. issue. So equity yeah. is very important. We have to apply the same standard to elder care as we provide to, as we expect of the rest of Medicare, that you should get essential care regardless of your ability to pay. So whether it's in your home, whether it's an institution, I think one of the biggest failings in our system is that middle ground between you can get home care and you need long-term care or supportive housing. We could keep a lot of people in the community if we subsidize their rent. Uh, you know, if you, we really need to study more carefully, why do people end up in long-term care homes? And usually it's for, often it's for really stupid reasons. They can't shovel their walk anymore. Mm -hmm. They're unable to go get groceries. All these things are solvable in the community. Uh, sometimes it's because they don't have a home. So let's figure that out rather than putting in, in the most expensive uh, uh, option. So there's a lot of things that can be done in, in that big middle that's, I think, the most neglected part of our care system. Yeah, the only the only thing I would add is, um, is I do, I agree with Andre, it's an equity issue. And I can say that in our project, the, the family members who participated in our project and offered their thoughts and ideas and experiences, on occasion talked about um, income loss, and expenses related to the support that they were providing to a resident in long-term care. And the stories that they told were often a bit surprising. There were things that might not have occurred to you, such as th just things like, um, you know, life happens, people move around a little bit. And, and now the family caregiver is, let's just say, living in, in Toronto or the Toronto area, and mom is in the long-term care home up in Perry Sound. And, um, and the person in Toronto is the closest family member to provide support. So they are heading up to Ferry, Perry Sound two, three times a week to spend some time with mom in the long-term care home. And there's a lot of wear and tear on, on that family caregiver and a lot of expense that they're facing. And, um, and there's just basically a kind of plea going out for some recognition of these difficulties that, uh, that some family caregivers are facing. Another question for you, uh, James. Can Dr. Conklin share his thoughts on secure units in Ontario? So secure units meaning, um, for example, dementia care units, right? That's that's what I'm understanding, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm I'm not an expert on, on that field, but I know that there's been a tremendous amount of work being done uh, over the past while about, um, about making residents that are more... Uh, are more appealing to people living with dementia. I guess I could say that I have a kind of personal stake in this and that uh, like Andre, I have a parent, uh, my mother died during the pandemic in a long-term care home and she was living with dementia at that time. And so, um, you know, it's a question that's of some importance to me. And my impression is that um, this is another area, unfortunately, where Canada is lagging behind some other parts of the world and there have been other parts of the world that have been experimenting with uh, new kinds of living arrangements that are more suited to people um, living with dementia. And I guess, you know, I understand the importance of ensuring that a person is safe. And I guess that's the rationale behind these sorts of secure units that you have, but surely there's a way to think outside of that box in terms of a living arrangement that would be more like a community and that would also be safe. It's almost like, it's almost like the prison, this prison metaphor that Andre has, uh, has presented us with here today. It's almost like we have a prison in our minds. We're imprisoned by the current way of thinking about these things. And I would hope that there, is, there are other ways of, uh, of providing living arrangements for these people that are less like prisons. I wondered, as someone who had uh, two parents in secure units, I have a couple of comments if I could. I think, first of all, we have to build facilities purposefully. You know, we have the vast majority of people have cognitive issues. Many have dementia in these facilities, but they're not built for them. So we have to have, uh, we don't have to have these corridors, these narrow corridors. We need wider uh, places people can wander. Uh, one of the best facilities I've seen has a figure eight track. So people who with dementia often like to wander, but they don't like to come up against walls. So they walk in a figure eight. Uh, they should have access to outside. Uh, uh, Sunnybrook is one of the best care homes in Canada. They have a lovely outdoor garden that's safe for people to wander in. 
Uh, that's the kind of things we need. Uh, we have to not punish people because they have sleep disruptions. They get up in the middle of the night uh, when uh, facilities are understaffed and then they send the police to come and get them and bring them to the emergency room. These are policies that are absurd uh, because they're not designed for the residents. So build and create policies for purposefully for the demographic that's there and a lot of the problems will uh, be resolved. You know, we know why people act out. They act out because they're stressed, they're confused, they're scared, and you can take away a lot of those frightening elements with better structure and with better policies. There are a number of pop promising practices that have emerged around sort of architecture, um, and these should be built into, you know, any of the bids to build new homes rather than these massive ones. So, again, what is the purpose uh, behind the home? What are, you know, and how the regulations could be supportive as opposed to punitive, right? I mean, others talked about, you know, different uh, regulatory regimes. If we don't increase the staffing, we are just requiring um, the few staff that are there to undertake additional work to meet regulatory regime um, requirements as opposed to requirements of care. Mm -hmm. And and what the one thing that was really really important, and you know, before doing this work, you know, I had spent a lot of time in in my mom's long term care facility. That was an N of one. You know, we spend time in other facilities and it causes you to think, what would I want? What is a day in my life? Do I want to have autonomy about when I wake up, what I eat for breakfast? If I eat for breakfast, do I absolutely want to participate in these activities or have the choice not to participate in activities? I want to have some choice. You know, if I want to just go off and do something, something else, right? I mean, we do not purpose build the structures, nor the policies, nor the regulatory regimes around these being places for people to live. And what we expect of our own life, autonomy, dignity, respect, care, right? So I think we have to, this is part, I think, of the philosophical shift that Andre speaks about. Well, we have to build that into the actual facilities the policies and the regulatory regimes. I know that time flies. Uh, one last question to the three of you. Any, any thoughts you may want to share on moving towards the, the national uh, slash federal standards regarding long-term care? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll start. Uh, you know, I think standards are, are important. Uh, they're a great conversation starter, but until we have staff to follow through, it's kind of pointless, to be honest. So we have to give, if we're going to have standards, we have to give life to them. We have to invest in them. James? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, that, um, that to me, um, again, drawing on, drawing on my background in organizational science, to me, the main point this is going to sound a bit funny, maybe, but the main point of, invest, of investing time and effort and money in the creation of standards for long-term care is has to do with the process of creating the standards, not just the standards themselves. The standards, creating the standards is an occasion for a national conversation about these issues and these problems. And we talk about this business of combating ageism and trying to create a new philosophy, a new mindset, a new way of thinking. That is the huge opportunity, I think, that's available through the creation of something like national standards. And I hope that those who are leading this process are aware of it and are indeed pulling as many different people into that conversation as possible. If I, I'm, I'm going to go to Ivy to, to, to give the final word, but I just want to focus on what you just said, James. The process is important as it should involve older adults themselves, all of us as well. And I, I want to relate back to this philosophical shift, think changing the way we see aging, which means it's not about the older adults. It's about me as well. And it's about accepting also vulnerability, which I think in our, in our culture is, is not even part of our discourse of our narrative. So Ivy, what are your thoughts on the national yes. So just building on this, I think national standards is an important conversation that we need to have. I think that conversation needs to be a public conversation. 
I worry sometimes that national standards are created by people with expertise. And although Andre says he does not have expertise, according to my presentation, the importance of experiential knowledge is, of course, I think that if we're inclusive of all of the different forms of knowledge and expertise that can be brought to bear, that's why I would want it to be out in the public very much. And this is how we get those conversations and the philosophical, philosophical shift. We need to think about it. Yes, as uh, James, James mentions, processes are important, structures are important, and a focus on outcomes. Can we agree upon what it is that we're hoping to achieve with these standards? What are the principles that we want to abide by in the same way that we had that conversation about principles in the Canada Health Act? But I think there are a broader set of principles that we would want to include here. And so I think that we need to think about that in that multi-layered way, but very much that this is a public conversation. That's how we are going to get better agreement and inclusivity and recognizing these different circumstances that sometimes we don't take into consideration because someone has brought it to the table. Uh, open, accountable, transparent conversations, structures that match in you know, the processes that match outcomes that we can agree upon with principles. I think that that's the way that we need to go in a national conversation about standards.